Okay. I'm going to be talking about synthetic biology, DIY bio, the whole biopunk movement, biohackers. Um, anybody out there have a basic understanding of biology? Hands raised. Yes. I'm going to go over the basics real quick just to catch everybody up. Um, a new way of looking at DNA is more of an information process. And this is a ribosome that is transcribing genetic information into a physical structure called a protein. And um, this is an inside view of what's going on. This yellow is actually RNA, which is kind of like a RAM version of stored in memory. And it's, it's launching it through um, a compiler, a genetic compiler. And that red thing is the program that's actually being compiled and physically assembled. And that protein, the possibilities of which it can fold into, there's, there's more possibilities than like atoms in the universe on a simple protein like this. So to be able to predict these things are extremely hard. But this stuff is, is nanotechnology, how we've always dreamed of it. Nature's already accomplished it. This is uh, real time. DNA copying itself, and these are uh, the proteins, the molecular machinery that, that actually regulates all this stuff. So, um, yeah, th this stuff's amazing, and, and if we could get our hands on it, it, it is what we've always dreamed of. So, um, this is uh, ATP synthase. So those, those yellow dots going around there, those are actual protons, and like the electrons go around through a motor, it's the same thing, but it's a nanomotor. And this actually charges up ATP, which is the currency of the cell, the energy form of pretty much all life. But that's, uh, that's how it works there. So this stuff is really impressive, neat thing. So I guess what I'm trying to say is biology is technology, as Rob Carlson says here. And there's no difference between code and machines and genetic code and the computer it runs on, the wetware, the cell. So. DNA is an information process. Metabolism is, is an information process. We're all familiar with this. Everybody here at the Maker Fair is probably a geek and a nerd, and we understand Moore's Law and exponential growth, and it's given us all this really cool stuff. Well, there's something else that we don't know about that we haven't really heard about. This blue line is traditional Moore's Law, but the rate at which we can sequence DNA has just been going through the roof, and that, that yellow line behind it is to, to write DNA. So as you see, this is a logarithmic graph, and it is just going straight up. So on an exponential graph, th this, is, this is amazing. Same thing, just uh, different information. National Institute of Health, um, that's where Moore's, this is called the Carlson curve. Rob Carlson predicted this, and it's just falling through this floor. It, it, it's crazy. What this means is we'll be able to radically sequence DNA for, for pennies, fractions of pennies, and at a price and performance that's unprecedented. We're not even going to be able to keep up with it with traditional Moore's Law. Here's another graph. We're going to have such a data input. We're not even, like Google's big data is nothing compared to, to what the genetic information is that's going to be coming in. So right now, we can probably run a full human genome. Let's try to get it under $1,000, but we can do it in like a couple of hours. We did the entire human genome the first time, it took billions of dollars in 15 years, and people said it couldn't be done, and it's, it was equated to us landing on the moon, our generation's moon landing, of what an accomplishment it was, and now you could do it uh, you know, on a little chip with a little USB drive or something. So, <laughs> and, you know, I was, I was in college when they finished this, so it, it's, it wasn't that long ago. Um, same information, reading and writing, gene synthesis and uh, price per dollar is what this is. So you can see $100, $10, $1, $0.10, $0.10 a penny, and that, that's going to continue. That There's no reason this is going to stop anytime soon. Same thing with um, the sequencing added on there. So you can, you can just see how cheap it's become to sequence. 10 to the negative 6 dollars per, per base pair. Um, so this enters this whole new paradigm of, of amateur biology, DIY bio, because if it's so cheap and so accessible, it's not locked up in, in prestigious universities with all these labs and huge equipment that cost a lot. We have biobricks. And what we have is, um, like we had the, the early day electronic components that were in magazines where you could go into a catalog and look up your resistors and your capacitors and standardized parts. You could model a circuit based off of math and, and engineering with, I don't know why these are auto advancing, 
We have um, the same for, for BioBricks, is what they're called. They're modular genetic parts that can all snap together. And there is a catalog at MIT called the Registry of Standard Biological Parts. And you can see what connects to what and how, and you can build genetic circuits. And this is done out of place. Um, once a year, there's a huge competition at MIT. And this is how the parts catalog grown so quickly. is because it's all open source, and the parts must contribute new parts. When you make it what is called iGEM, the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition. And every year it gets just more and more big, and more and more people are doing stuff. And it's really impressive. So here's some of the, um, some of the genetic circuits. And it's very akin to, to digital electronics. And I'll, I'll come back to this analogy more. But um, promoters stop sequences, transcribing, all, all different parts of genetic circuits that would turn on and off genes, and they're, they're kind of like logic statements. Um, here at UVA, your um, local Charlottesville here, at um, iGEM, when I first went up there in 2009, it was really neat what they were doing, was they had a, um, a cell that could pump arsenic in and out of the cell. They were able to turn off the out pump and just have it pump into the cell. So it was a way of capturing arsenic. And they had a way to turn on the gene only when it could detect arsenic in the water because there's no sense in transcribing all this expensive metabolic machinery if you're not going to use it. So only if arsenic was present in the water would turn on these genes to do that. And that was neat. And they went to the competition and they presented their stuff. But the important thing is, because this is modular parts, because this is real engineering, we can stand on top of their work that has already existed and change it and take it apart or add to it or, or it's modular. So the next year, what they did, they took their exact same design and they added a, a buoyancy device. And when the cell filled up with enough arsenic, it would trigger this gene which would turn it on and it would inflate the cell and the cells would float to the top of the water and you could skim them off and actually capture the arsenic out. So as they're, they're dividing and growing, they're self-replicating the full ones that are, it's, it's perfect. So if you can design for machines like this, you can program like any other information technology. Um, we're laser printing DNA now, and a lot of it's going to genetic compilers and a lot of software-based things. Um, 3D printing, you just heard all about that. Bioprinting is the next big thing. And these are just some, some, some things I'm gonna come back to. Um, I pretty much put all these slides together this morning, so I'm, I'm just kind of going through. My main point of this is that we're kind of in an enlightenment period right now where we have abundance of free information on the internet, access to, to information. It, never before has this happened. So if we're in an enlightenment, it's logical to see think that um, revolution would happen. And here at the Maker Fair, Make magazine, make everything. We're, we're definitely in, in a renaissance period where everybody's a maker, everybody's a tinker, everybody's a DIY. That, that, that really comes back to that. And that's, this blossoming comes from the enlightenment of free information. So there, there was a maker fair at the White House recently, you know, all this stuff. There's hacker spaces, you know, this is where people get together and make cool stuff. Again, I don't have to explain this to you guys, you know. And there's real things that have come to market, real products, real industries that have been created from, you know, just a bunch of hackers in a garage making stuff, and now there's, there's real products. What's going on, there, there's a whole parallel to this with open wetware, DIY bio, biohacker spaces are the new things that are springing up everywhere. Um, GenSpace is uh, one of the first ones that, that came up. BioCurious is another big name one. They're out on the West Coast. Um, there's an idea that a lot of this equipment is too expensive and too hard to use, so the, the hackers are getting it, and they're, they're taking it apart, and they're making cheap open source versions of it. The uh, open PCR machine is one of the first ones that came out, and um, it's about a $600 kit that came out of BioCurious, and you can order this. And for those who don't know, PCR is uh, it's like a DNA Xerox machine. You can copy up exponentially to as much DNA as you want clone a gene, whatever. It's, it's one of the backbone tools. Um, as soon as this was invented, every lab got it, it was adopted. That guy got a Nobel Prize practically overnight for it. It was one of those things. And it was in the 80s. So it's a pretty new technology, and it used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars for these machines. And they were huge, and same, same sort of thing. So um, 
let's take a step back and, and think, okay, I, I get all this stuff, but what, 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 do, what is the synthetic biology going to do? I don't get it. Think about everything a cell can make, going just around the top here. We have wood, paper, cotton, textiles, leather, latex, plastics, all kinds of oils, natural gas, coals. All of these are of biological output. They're, they're processes of uh, either metabolism or, or just biology in general. Or, and these are all things that we use, we, we get from nature. And there's gotta be better ways of, of getting this, such as insulin. We, we used to just take insulin from pigs and uh, the, the prices were tied to the meat markets and, and, and it was a dual usage of, of competition. So it, it wasn't really good. The prices fluctuated up and down. It was very unstable and highly volatile. We, one of the first big biotech things was we took the gene for human insulin, put it into an E. coli or a yeast cell, and we can brew them up in large vats and make all the insulin we want. Its prices are cheap and stable. Um, it's ethical to, to get it this way. Same thing with um, to curdle milk into cheese, the enzymes used, we could only get it from the bellies of baby calves. And until we could produce it just recently, synthetically, uh, that was the only way we made cheese, was slaughtering baby pigs and calves for, for their enzymes and their biological parts. So there's, a, there's an idea that we could really obtain any, any raw material, any energy source, any pharmaceutical, through these means and because it's a self-replicating organism, we could scale to, to billions. It could solve world problems. Um, I'm recycling some of these slides, so put them all in there. Think about a dog. A dog is no more than food, air, and you know, the dog food and water. That's that's all that's in there, and the genetic information that the dog is running, that, that genetic compiling that, that's put into it. What's the difference between this and a cat? Nothing, just the, the, the software, the operating system that's being run on it. It, it takes raw materials, moves the atoms around, rearranges them, and this is the output program that it's, it's running. So if we could program for this, we could, we could get all those, those materials that we want from nature. Now, this analogy of synthetic biology being a lot like the uh, computer errors, when computers first came around, they were, it was, this was kind of the, the parody, the joke of like, oh sure, housewives are gonna be computer programmers and take care of these huge scientific machines that take teams of real engineers to keep up. And people said, yeah, you know, this is how it's gonna go. And today, this is really how we interface, is um, can't even speak verbally, and this child's interfacing with like, the collective consciousness of humanity. Oh. And, oh. <laughs> right. So it, it came a lot easier than we thought and at a lot quicker time. So I'm saying that, sure, we already have the infrastructure in place. Is everybody gonna be a synthetic biologist or something? Well, homebrew is a, is a big thing. This is, this is a pharmacological lab. You, know, you can do anything you wanted with this. If you custom tailored your, your yeast or your enzyme to produce whatever you want, th this is a garage setup. And there's no reason why you couldn't scale to larger things. People already do all kinds of biological stuff at home. They make yogurts and cheese and kombucha cultures and, and different things like that. So I'm thinking, you want a 3D printer like thing. I know we actually have bio 3D printers, but you want a, a fat machine for, for your biology, your bread machine or your yogurt machine. This, these are the things that people are gonna hack to, to make stuff. What if, what if your grandmother could get her cancer drugs that are custom tailored just for her? She could design on them, put them in here, grow them up overnight, and she could eat them with breakfast. Or maybe you could uh, get something like a, a weather report for the biological storm that's out there, and you could just build it into your food, or you could just brew up your own beer of whatever you want. And th th this is the kind of access we're going to start seeing. Gonna, this, these are the tools people are gonna hack or, or recreate for these sorts of purposes. Um, all this sounds complicated. How are we going to design for this? Well, there's gonna be CAD programs. This is a complete metabolic pathway of, a, of an enzyme, I mean of a E. coli cell. And um, you would search it just like you would Google Maps. Say you wanna go from uh, glucose to, to methanol. This, this program is called Genome Compiler. Um, a friend of mine's working on it who got picked up by Autodesk. Autodesk is big into this. They're, they're looking hardcore into this. 
But just like Google Maps, you would be able to search turn by turn direction sort of thing of like points to chemicals to enzymes and the, the processes and pathways that they take. And it would even suggest, you know, that this is an incomplete thing, but oh, you could, where it's red, here's a list of possible candidates to turn this thing into this to complete your path. And then you could just select this, build it, drag it into your shopping cart, and then they would FedEx you the, the genetic material the next day, and you could put it into your, your cell and see if it would boot up your program. And this is how easy it's going to be. This is another game called uh, Folded. It, it's free and online, and it's, it's a game. You get points, and it's the protein folding game. That's what I was talking about earlier, how many combinations there were for possible protein shapes. Well, if you turn it into a game, they don't know that they're, they're calculating, you know, gives free energy of the spontaneous, all this. It's, it's a negative delta G's a point that you'd get up. And um, people have actually solved real problems with this. This was a, um, a, a game that they put out there, and they started putting real world problems into it, and people started solving them. So they put things that were unfinished that had just baffled scientists forever, and one of them was like the, the headpiece of HIV or something like that. It had gone unsolved, the structure of it, for like 13 or 14 years or something like that. And it was like a, a 14 or 15 year old kid figured it out in like a, a couple weeks or a month or something like that. And he doesn't know what he's doing, it's just kind of fun to do this, you know. He, he hasn't studied molecular genomics or anything like that, proteomics, and he, he's just doing what feels natural to them. So if we can get these tools and this information into the hands of more people that can think creatively and, and, and flex on this stuff, we're gonna see it taken down different avenues that not even the smart of us, the smartest of us could, could think of. Artists are getting their hands on this too. Bio art is, a, is a, another huge thing. But um, Genome Compiler, I would look it up. It's a free program, it's, it's really cool. And the idea is you could make a, a complete life form from scratch. You custom des design anything. And right now these are just single cell life, you know. But there's no reason why you couldn't um, drag and drop a pet, you know, and just put the parts in there that you want. You have your library of, of things, so um, why not? There's a, there's a group out there right now that just finished their uh, Indiegogo campaign. It's for, uh, for vegan cheese. And, um, they're, they're trying to come up with uh, all the enzymes and all the, the precursors of, of milk, of the proteins, the milk proteins grown synthetically, and then you could make cheese with it, and it would be no different than the cheese on the shelf. And if you could do that, you could just kind of bypass all of dairy and just, yeah. You could grow it up in huge vats, like uh, at a brewery or something, how they have down the street. So these are, these are the things that are coming online and the big sort of industries that are going to emerge soon. So this is how computers were. Huge rooms, lots of people to take care of them. And these guys came along and made it personal. And this is the lab where, you know, they had a garage, I should say, <laughs> not lab, <laughs> garage. And um, we have this wooden box. Now, that's cute and it's neat, but eventually, a couple decades later, it turned into this. And that's, that's it speaks for itself. Today, we have something like the open PCR machine. I have one out here on um, our, our table on display that came out of the uh, BioCurious. But these are the old sequencers of you know, the previous generation, the old PCR machines and stuff. And they look a lot like those old mainframes right here. The, you know, huge rooms took teams of scientists to come up. This is the Minion. This actually finally just came to market. They've been talking about it for a while. And it's a USB high throughput machine. It, it can do vast amounts of DNA, like high speed sequencing. It's, it's, it costs next to nothing. It uses like these nano pores. It, it, it's amazing. I check out the company. It's, it's, it's cool. And it's, I forget what they quoted it on, but it's like under $1,000 for something like that. So if you can take it into the field, that's. So what is this going to lead to? Something like this Gattaca handheld scanner. So if we think about this, we take an iPad and we give it to like children and we send them out in the backyard. We don't tell them how to use it. They don't speak yet, things like that. What are we going to do with this compressed lab that can fit everything on a, on a chip and we're gonna just give it to our kids and have them go sequence all the new bacteria in the soil or something. And then you start thinking about stuff. Okay, so we have the, um, chemical industry, and out of that era came emergency protocols and stuff, something like a fire extinguisher that changed society, changed building code, changed 
all these things. They must be there by law. And, you know, they've been fully integrated into society now. We, pretty much at the end of the flourishing of the, the computer silicon digital paradigm, you know, that's that, that this, we're in the heyday peak of that, and we're starting to see all the fruits of that come to market now, such as these auto defenders. And these aren't standard yet, but we're seeing them, and they're, they're going to come now. So it's kind of fun to think what, what's going to come out of this. So right now, um, hospital bills are, are unjustifiably high, and um, we need something like a bio blue book that would standardize these things. The only way that there was a standardized for, for cars and auto, because these guys could charge whatever they wanted, they could make up terms and things, talk over your head. It was just too hard to, to get your head around this huge machine you had to take care of. And so they listed, you know, this is about how much it should cost for this. This is how much repair should cost. And there's a hospital bill. So what if it turns into something more like this? You have your bio printer. And say, um, these emergency responses, oh, going back to, um, sorry, finish this thought. The emergency responses that would come out of the, the biotech would be, I don't know, maybe like spray-on skin that you could have for emergency band-aids or something like that, or, or blood clots that could stop you know, wounds from healing, or um, messenger RNA bandages that could just interface directly with your immune system. And if it's an information process, it could just jumpstart and mount to a healing response right away. You know, so we could do different things from that. So say we stabilize you, and before you get in this ambulance and agree to all this stuff, you say, hey, well, the guy down the street is printing up parts for a fraction of the cost, you know? You change your muffler at, at down the street for the guy. Well, he can give me a new liver and guarantees it and blah, blah. So the consumer's gonna be more savvy and be able to hassle more, and it's really going to, to empower us, and it's not gonna be just this monopoly of what it is. And right now, if you think about it, there's home diagnostic tests for all kinds of things. You can go, the store and test anything. You, you, and that, that's pretty much your freedom as, a, as an intelligent consumer. You can do quality assurance. You can, you can check everything in your life, except for the biology around you. How do you know that your, your GMO-free food is really GMO-free? Or how do you even know that the, the slabs of meat that you're getting that they say this fish is, this, is really what they say it is? And that's actually a real example that open PCR machine was used up in New York City by uh, some high school girls took it and they went to the fish markets and actually got samples and found that this high priced meat wasn't what they said it was. It was actually like grouper or something like that. And they went back to them and said, hey, you know, this is not what you say it is. And they said, really? We didn't know. We've been paying all the money for this too. So there's, there's a new way of checking and this is going to empower individuals. Um, there's a whole program out there now to make synthetic yeast. Synthetic yeast 2.0 is a, a, a website you can go to and check this out. And it would be a completely synthetic life form that would be custom tailored to, to be like a workhorse, to be this utilitarian thing that could be scaled up to and purpose for, for anything because it's based in software. It's, it's, its father was a, was a computer printer, you know? So, um, and this is where it's going to exist. Say we need to get a um, new vaccine or a, a new sort of pharmaceutical out there. We can give it to all the local breweries and towns and they can just brew up and large scale distribution. Because this is how we're going to be able to reach you know, billions and billions of people. They're, it's, they're expected to be 10 billion people soon. And how are we going to produce all the needs that we, for, for all this stuff? Um, I'm jumping around here. So this is a, uh, digital attack map of the internet. This is all the incoming threats, all the, all the places all over the world, all the different types of protocol. And this is only the top like 2%. And um, I recorded the traffic of this. And a lot of people get scared with this biotechnology and they say, what, what's going to happen with this? If everybody can program life. Like there, there's some twisted people out there. They're gonna be bioterrorists. They're going to custom design these things that go after us and well, we have the internet and there's, there's coding already and it's kind of like the sandbox that we have and there's zero day attacks all the time. There's new viruses written all the time, new exploits, new, new vulnerabilities found. The internet doesn't crash, the internet doesn't turn off. In fact, it's the only machine we've ever had that has run for thousands of days consistently and it's not going to stop. And it's because hackers are now kind of like the immune system of the internet. They, they find all these exploits and they, they defend against them. They patch them. They, they update the code. They, they're this ongoing response. And it's a very organic 
response. So that's what we need with these bio labs because you know these guys got our backs, right? When when horrible diseases come through, maybe I don't know because due to government funding they might not be around. Um, this is just you know speculative, but what if something does happen? Who who would we turn to to help defend us? Where, where's the, the people's militia of biotechnology? Uh, doesn't exist. So we need the hackers and the makers. We need, um, we need the, 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 the biohackers to be like the natural immune system like the hackers are to the internet. Something else that's really neat is um, we're not completely unregulated. We're not just this, this ragtag anarchist group that's just doing you know, rogue outlaw biology and stuff. There, there's actual the concern, genuine concern from people about these things. And uh, the FBI is actually involved with a lot of the, uh, the DIY labs. There's an outreach program to, to maybe not come down on these hackers as they did in the past. They found that, you know, maybe the ironclad going after every hacker who says he's a hacker, not knowing or understanding what they've done, locking them up, throwing them away. That doesn't really build good rapport or trust with that community. And now they employ those digital hackers all the time. That those are the people who defend the internet and they're the good guys. They're like the Jedi's and the ninjas. I think they're they're seeing that maybe they need to, to trust these new biohackers and, and see what the potentials are out there and get level playing field, not just go after these guys. So they they've actually kind of wised up and, and they're very forward thinking about this. So if you start a DIY lab and, and you're out there doing something, which I encourage you to do, and the Department of Justice comes knocking on your door, don't freak out. They're, they're actually a program to outreach this. To, to It's a lot of trust on both sides. If you have an independent group doing rogue biology and FBI guys sound scary at the same time. So, you know, to come out and, and talk about things together, I think that's a it's a good line. But if you, if you see more of this, don't be surprised. Um, and again, these are the guys we need to defend Department of Defense Against the Dark Arts sort of thing. It's the biopunks, the biohackers. Um, skipping around real quick, there's a um, documentary that just launched, uh, Dicep DIY. And um, these guys went around the country and filmed all these labs, all this DIY movement. A lot of bio artists, that's really more their focus of what they did. And their first episode just aired, and it's all about the startup lab. And Biologic, my lab that I created in Norfolk, Virginia, um, it's featured in there. And it's about a 10 or 15 minute documentary, so I'd suggest it's free to look at on the internet. And stay tuned for more of what they're putting in there. And um, you go to biologiclabs.org, well, that, this didn't update. Okay, well, I have more information up there, but that's our contact, go there, or look us up on Facebook, Biologic Dev. And um, come by the lab um, display out front, and we could talk more, answer questions specifically, show you off some of the equipment. If you ever come to Norfolk, I'll show you the lab as well. But uh, that's the end of the uh, formal slide presentation. If anybody has questions, I'm not sure how much more time we have, but we're going to talk. time. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, GMOs, you, you were said, you're talking about those. I mean, here's somebody I would trust. I mean, I, I'm a skeptic, so I pretty much believe they're biologically identical. Right. I feel like right. I've done a lot of research on it. Um, people just will never change their minds about it. Right. Golden rice is going to save hundreds of thousands of kids. Right. Right. You're the guy pushing the buttons in there, so what do you, what do you think? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's, it's, we're in an interesting time, and you know, I think uh, I'm gonna misquote Carl Sagan, but he said something. He said something about how we're more technologically reliant on everything more than ever. Our, our whole society is based on science and technology, and we have the most distrust in it now. And it, yeah. like, why? Why is that? The anti-vax movement, yeah. that, that sort of thing. How do we reach this? And recently, I actually saw an article that had. Um, a plot that was of uh, competence in jobs and warmth or empathy was the X and Y plot. And people would, you know, lawyers were, you know, down there but highly competent or this or that. Okay, um, and scientists were, were labeled highly competent but just under the warmth empathy thing. So it's like, 
the people don't really have a trust for for scientists. Like we don't have their best interest in mind, or maybe maybe we're there's a conspiracy in there. Or corporations are controlling us, or we're going where the money is, or it, that's hard. They're, they're, they're not stupid. These are these are like some of the most affluent people in in the country, and that's where like some of the highest most anti-vax rates are and stuff. So it's not that they don't have access to information or under. It's that they're, they're not scientifically literate. And maybe with open labs, open technology, open protocols, it's completely transparent. People can do it for themselves in their home. They don't have to trust somebody else. They could do it themselves. That might bring it back. They would then be more scientifically literate, too, to understand what it means, what's different, what's, what's a concern, what's not a concern, and, and be able to quantitatively measure that concern, not just have an emotional reaction to it, but say, you know, this risk is a hundred times greater than this one, like, we're, we're safe, or, you know, different things like that. So, I don't know, there's no silver bullet for that answer, I wish we could, but I guess the open movement is one of the ways to it, and just showing people you know, scientific literacy, which is the whole DIY bio movement's sort of purpose to have cheaper equipment, access to, to information and technology to have your own quality assurance. Kind of like the hacker ethics is to get a computer in the hands of everybody on the planet, not just the industrialized nations, but everybody. I mean, now we're seeing Raspberry Pis and things like that. So it's coming. And, and hopefully, with the, the Carlson curve there, this is coming at 10 times the rate of Moore's Law. So every year we have in biotechnology, that's like 10 years, of a, a decade in, in silicon production. So in the last couple of years, we've pretty much caught up to the modern digital age and we're just smashing right through that. And they think it's gonna be about 2020 or 2030 by the time we cannot even process this information. It's coming in so much, even with the exponential growth of modern technology and, and the ways we can calculate this on current trajectories, not coming in with quantum computing, or even just using this biological computing as a computer. Why, why not use DNA as an information storage system? Its data correction system is orders of magnitudes better than any of the, the hard drives or error correcting RAM or, or all, all that stuff that we have. That even gets it wrong. So biology, it, 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 it's much more efficient. It, it is an information process that we can program for. We don't even need to build these nano machines. We can just learn how to code them wow. and they'll do the work. Wow. Very cool. Um, I guess I kind of answered the question. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm yeah. glad you quoted <laughs> Any other questions? Mm. How much time do we have? Well, I mean, you can do another, you know, 10 minutes. If you want. Sure, yeah, I mean, I can talk about all, all kinds of stuff with this. I'm just kind of freestyle in this, I, I just put some visual things together to keep me on point. But, um... So, Jameson, yes. I'm sorry I, I came into this late. No, no, you're great, yeah. Has someone brought up the subject of rogue? No. What do you mean? Rogue <laughs> elements. Uh, well, he talked yeah, about bioterrorism. Oh, okay. And oh, yeah, yeah, okay, you did just come in. Self-correcting by <coughs> having the internet has attacks all the time, and we've learned to build stuff to prevent okay. that because of the attacks. It's the okay. same idea biologically. Yeah, if I get what I learned. Right, right, yeah, yeah. And a lot of that is from open source movements, you know, the sharing of, of information. That's how we have such a strong defense of the internet. That, that's what we're going to need is not a restriction of this, but a, a, a forward movement. We need more bio labs. Like, think, think about this. If you had, like, something like the zombie apocalypse go off, wouldn't you want biohackers in that world? Yeah. Wouldn't you, right? Wouldn't you want like these molecular bio labs that are in every major cities that you can go to and maybe, you know, people think, all right, I can go to the, the makerspace and build machines or tanks or something in the MLBR. How do you, how do you fight the science, <laughs> you know? How do, right, so we could build mesh nets and have communication, but how do you, how do you do bio stuff? So we, we, we need those. We need those kinds of people to, to defend their, the good hackers, as we all know, that those philosophies. But um. But it doesn't. It seems like you need some of. Like if you're trying to fight a certain disease, you need that disease to test. Oh sure, sure, yeah, absolutely. So well, you're, you're potentially. This is what's neat. It's an uh, information technology. So if we could, in a safe lab with biosafety level four, we could just sequence the genetics, 
put this into the internet, have a model simulation software, people could problem solve collectively, people work on the proteins, people work on this, and, and the software is going to get much better, so we wouldn't have to actually... So the simulation, in a way. Right, because the, it is information, and if we could figure out the physics of it, which Autodesk is putting tons of money into, look at the Project Cyborg, and like things like the genome compiler, we might be able to work on this more. And that's actually one of the things that uh, Craig Venter brought up, is that the next Mars rover that we're probably going to build, is not there yet, but would probably have a genetic sequencer on it. If and when we found a, a Martian life form on their single cell bacterium or something like that, we could sequence it right there and then beam life across planets at the speed of light, like, like teleporters, like digital panspermia or something like that, and then build it back here on Earth and not in a safe lab and not have like a capsule come back and maybe explode in the atmosphere and like contaminate everything. It's much more safer to, to teleport the information than, than the actual organism and then rebuild the organism on this end. So we could beam alien life from planet to planet and it's not science fiction anymore. So yeah, it, it, this technology is really mind blowing the more you start thinking about it and the more you start applying it to everyday uses. Can my Wi-Fi handle that? <laughs> yeah. How many, how many people yell, kill the witch when they see you talk? <laughs> I am the mad scientist. You know, so. No. Kill the witch. I am, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was really great. I went to the uh, local butcher shop to uh, ask them if I could, uh, I was thinking about get, getting different animal organs. And I'm talking to them, I'm like, we're going to have a couple weird questions. I'm going, can you get hearts? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, can you get different organs? They're like, yeah, yeah. Can you get heads of animals? And they're like, yeah, we can. I'm like, well, I'm thinking about doing like brain dissection classes in my lab and different things. And they're like, oh, that's so cool. And you know, they're butchers, so they like all the gory <laughs> stuff. And we're talking about doing ghost hearts in a, in a jar for maybe Halloween classes or something like wow. that. Take home your own heart. Or, I want one. Yeah. But what would be really cool this is a little bit more of a pipe dream, but what would be neat is they've already done this, and we would need to be BSL-2, biosafety level 2, to start working with stem cells and human cells and different sort of pathogens. Because uh, to answer your question, there are actual regulations. You cannot work with pathogenic things. Most biohacker spaces do not do anything of that sort just by ethical standards. But um, you can take one of these hearts, and what's called a ghost heart, they, they just literally stitch a hose right into the aorta wash all, all the DNA gunky stuff out, and you're just left with the white scaffolding. But then people have actually been able to reintroduce um, human stem cells to it, and it'll actually make myocardium tissue on there and a bioreactor, and it'll actually start beating, beating heart in a dish. And then if I took this from my stem cells, that is my heart, that is my genetic information. So if I needed a new heart for transplant, there's no rejection at all. I don't even need the, the drugs at all. That is my body. My it, it, it recognizes it as the same. So we could grow up and 3D print all this. It's something like eight out of ten people die waiting for the transplant of the organ, not from the, the surgery or any complications, but just the shortage of organs there aren't enough. So there's all these problems that we're going to see, such as the the insulin shortage problem. That was that was in the late 70s, early 80s that that finally came online. That was the first big like product come to market, biotechnology, something like that, that really stood out. And that wasn't that long ago, so we're, we're gonna see all kinds of things. Think about um, algae. If we could hack algae, it runs on sugar and sunlight, and it could produce jet fuel from the carbon dioxide in the air. It could produce leather, it could produce anything we wanted to do, and for free, yeah, eventually, you know, that, that's essentially what it would be, is free. And then you could scale it up and give it to other people. You could give it to third world countries. And what does it cost you? It's like file sharing music or something. You know, you just copy the information and give it to them. Jameson, which government agencies regulate or watch you? Is it a state agency or federal? Uh, yeah, there is no real regulations, but the FBI is involved and they just want to be a part of the conversation and they've actually don't want to get involved they want to see this be a self-policing self-regulating community and they do not want to have to write laws and legislation because this is not their field and they don't want to bring these ironclad laws down what if we we swap team 
Steve Jobs and stuff and outlawed electronics and, and said this was a bad thing. Would America be this great digital empire? Would we have Silicon Valley? Would we be, you know, the world runs our operating systems, the Apples and OS's uh, and um, Microsoft and stuff. We, it, like, that America would not be as prosperous if we didn't embrace these things. So what, what's going to happen if we're not literate in science, and specifically genetic information? We're, we're going to fall behind. We're, we're, we're going to be some back country that people forget about in a few decades. And so the FDA or the CDC has... The FDA would be involved if you wanted to give food out. You could do theoretical food in the lab, but you can't consume it, or you couldn't give it out or something like that. Because um, you're not really doing anything. If it doesn't leave the lab and you're not... You've got to kill everything. There's certain protocols, like so you can't take it home with you or something like that. But um, beer, you can actually do beer because you filter out all the biological stuff and it's just biological output. You, you know, like the, the alcohol and stuff in it is what the cells make, not cellular genetic material. But, but then again... Is this voluntary though? I mean, sure, you're yeah. voluntarily keeping these standards. You right. You really could. You could take stuff off. You, yeah, 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 you could. And that's where... That, that's why this is a developing community. That's why this is a brand new thing. And we're trying to find what, what, how do you do stuff like this? And these are great questions. And that's why we need more people involved. We don't need to close this off. We need to open it more and get more people aware. Because what's going to happen if we have to start making legislative, political things about this? And the general populace doesn't have any understanding about this. Uh, it's like, oh, should we be able to have Wi-Fi in homes? Or, no, no, let's just ban that. That sounds scary. Turn it off. And it's like, well, no, no, no. Certain levels and certain things and certain spectrums, it's just fine. And if we standardize and regulate it, this, this is great technology. If, if you think, like, in the walls, there's electricity and gas lines and stuff and all this dangerous stuff, but we have ways of controlling it and ways of regulating it. And there's legal inspection teams and things. And so. Like the fire extinguisher and the, and the auto defib, there's, there's going to be things that come out of this, but we, we need to do it in, a, in an intelligent and informed way that society agrees on with morals. And, and the more people who get this, the more insight will, will understand why artists need it, why, why children think certain things about it, and then it'll be a complete view of society that can help structure this. Because this is the most impressive and dangerous and scary technology we've ever seen. It, 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 it can literally take apart matter and rearrange it into whatever form we want. Like that, that's like nano swarm prey kind of stuff, you know. Like, so yeah, we, we, we need, it's equally destructive as it is empowering. So yeah, we, we, we shouldn't just do things because we can, but we should really morally step back and think about what we, we are creating. Because uh, if, if you read Frankenstein, that's kind of one of the most tragic things in that was um, the real book. <coughs> he was, uh, the monster was an uh, intelligent, empathetic, compassionate, wonderful thing, and his father just kind of like disowned him and banned him. And that was like the most tragic part about, the, that was the whole point of the, the ending of the book. And we can't turn our backs on what we create. We have to be very mindful of what we're creating, and we can't invent these Terminator monster things that run away and kill us. So, yeah, it's, it's a so, brave new world. So when you talked about sending over radio frequencies, sending information, genetic information, it makes me think of uh, Star Trek and yeah. the teleporter. It's teleporting, right. Yeah. It's, it's so it's, it's coming. Digital beaming of life, yeah. right. It's, uh, that's what I mean. We, we can't bury our heads in the sand anymore. Yeah. This is a... Uh, um, Right, right. The, um, yeah. It's funny, the, the, the word apocalypse, you know what it actually means? And uh, I think it's Greek or whatever. It just means the unveiling, the uncovering, the, uh, the lifting of the veil. Oh. And it, it's kind of a, a disclosure of information. So it's kind of like once you learn something, you can't unlearn, you can't go back. And I think that's what we're seeing right now is that not in a destructive apocalypse, but we're all going to be enlightened by this information. You can't go back after that. There's going to be a. Uh, no unlearning this once it's out of the box. Like once, once something's on the internet, you know you can't pull it back in. It's it's going to be the same sort of thing. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Is that is it about good on time? Perfect. Yep. Okay, great. Switch over. That was wonderful, man.
Thanks, guys. And uh, come out and check out the lab. We'll be there. Um, I'm in the, the table of the lab. We'll be there for a while. Um, answer more questions. Show up. Yeah, yeah, yeah.